So my name is Kate Matsudaira, and I'm here today to talk to you about big data without a big database. And there's been a lot of talks here about scaling and about data and different types of databases, but one of the more interesting things we do at Decide is we roll our own really large in-memory cache. This is buzzing a little bit. Oops. Um, and this is really exciting because it allows us to do things really fast. And so let's get started and talk about it. So in, when you think about data and applications, there's really two types of data. There's the dynamic, what I call user data, that's things like transactions, it's stuff that goes in your shopping cart, um, and then there's also reference data. And reference data is like a product catalog. So most of the time when you see a web page on a site, 90% of what you're looking at is reference data. Um, and this talk is really about reference data. It's not about the dynamic, high right user data. And just to kind of illustrate this point, this is a picture of our search results page. And on this page, what you'll see is that that is all reference data. Um, this is all the user data. Similarly, if you look at this web page of Amazon's catalog, this is all reference data. And this is user data. And just for one more example, if you look at uh, Bing Travel, if you think about maps and hotels, hotel availability, all reference data, and then your user data. So there's a lot of reference data out there. And reference data is a little bit special compared to user data because reference data has to be fast. You can't have slow reference data. I know, I love this slide. <laughs> you came here last year, I used it. I know, same picture, I just love it. Um, but reference data has to be fast because it's 90% of what users are seeing. So you have to, it doesn't have the same sort of limitations or some of the forgiveness that you might get with dynamic data that you'd store in a database. But let's talk about what I mean by fast because sometimes people think about fast differently. And so I'm talking about the fast of memory, where we're talking 100 nanoseconds is what it takes for a read, versus what you see with the network round trip or reading from disk. And even SSDs are slower uh, on the same order of magnitude. And so I like to think about it as if I'm at home and I'm thinking about a hot dog. If I want a hot dog and I go to my fridge, that's like reading from memory. But it's 5,000 times slower to get to read from disk, so it would be like driving to Florida to get the hot dog from where I live in Seattle. So that's a really long way uh, to go for a hot dog. Now, I've never been to Jacksonville, which is where this thing is, but I bet they probably have good hot dogs, good beaches, good hot dogs. Um, so when you think about performance, what you want to do is have as much of your data as possible in memory, because uh, that's going to make it fast. So let's talk about how this evolved, because I think it'll help everyone get on the same page, and about why a database wouldn't work. So initially, if you look at a simple service-oriented ori kind of architecture, you have your clients, your services, and a big database. Well, there's some obvious problems as you're looking at this, right? Like one is you have a major availability problem, because if your database goes away, you lose all your data. Uh, you also have performance problems. The, having one big database is a bottleneck, right? I, I know that you guys all know this stuff. You also have scalability problems because you're not able to store more data than what fits in a single database. So interreplication. So this is what you do uh, to solve the availability. You create a replica or a backup. And that might fix that problem, but you still have the scalability problem from before. You also still have the bottleneck and performance problems. And now you've introduced a new problem, which is operational overhead of maintaining and keeping that replica in sync. So let's talk about local caching. So if we want to solve performance, uh, introducing a local cache for each of the services is a great way to do that. Um, then they're reading from memory and not having to go across the network to your database. But we still have scalability problems, right? We're still limited by the data. Um, we still have the operational overhead from our new replica. And we still have some performance problems, although not on potentially the queries in the cache. But we've introduced more problems. 
Now we have consistency problems of keeping all this data in sync, and we have uh, what I call our long tail performance problems. Um, and so what those are, are basically just, if you're in e-commerce especially, typically you see uh, 80 to 90% of your traffic on a small subset of your data, what we call like head products or head queries. And so those are typically the things in the cache. So either you're going to evict the head things to put in long tail queries when those come in, or you're going to be evicting those out. So something's going to be slow. So this isn't really ideal. So let's talk about a big cache. Um, because this is often something that people think of, because this certainly will help with some of those long tail problems, because you're just able to fit a lot more data in cache, right? So you still have operational overhead from the replica. You still have your performance problems. Like, none of these things have gone away. Um, but you also now still have the consistency problems and some long tail performance problems, although less so than the service-based caches. And you also have more operational overhead. However, um, these big caches are really popular. Uh, I've used them in other uh, companies and web stacks. Um, some of you are really familiar with Memcache, um, Elasticache, which is the one that Amazon has in the cloud. Um, and then, of course, Oracle Coherence, which is uh, a bit more sophisticated, although also a bit expensive. So, when it comes to these caching technologies, there's, there's some good things and some bad things, right? The first one is that they're simple, right? They're key value stores. They're, you're able to put a lot of data in there. And that makes it really uh, easy to use. And it also scales really well horizontally by dynamically assigning different nodes to different partitions. It just kind of works out of the box. And that's really handy because you can put a lot of data in there. But, um, and even though it will dynamically rebalance the data, these are all good things, it also is sort of limiting because you have both the problem of loading the cache and poor performance on cold starts, but also um, if your data is not together and it's distributed you know, disparately across a bunch of different nodes, you lose all the ability that you get from scanning and querying for data that's close to one another. And so, um, moreover, there's no way to express dependencies of data and control your eviction. So, for example, if you have a data set that's dependent on another data set, it's very hard to then say, oh, make sure you update this data set too to invalidate both pieces without writing a lot of custom code. Now, Oracle Coherence admittedly does do a little bit of this stuff, um, but like I said, it's really expensive. So, with these big cache technologies, there are a lot of benefits, right? Like, you get um, you know, all the scaling and you get some performance, um, but you still have the operational overhead of this whole new system, and your performance does suffer in some circumstances. And at a minimum, you still have that drive to Florida to get the hot dog in the equation, right? You're still going over the network. Um, so that's not ideal. So what about NoSQL, right? Like everyone loves talking about those sort of databases. Uh, does that solve our problems? Well, depending on the one you choose, it might, but most of them have uh, some performance problems, uh, some scalability problems, and uh, some operational overhead, <laughs> keeping them all in sync. But moreover, just to go back to our performance reminder, any data you put into a remote store is going to have to go across the network. This means that the minimum, like our typical amount of time, is 1.75 milliseconds, right? And a read from memory is 100 nanoseconds. So this is a huge delta. Um, so if we go to this and we look at this to retrieve a single value, it probably doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's sort of insignificant. But where it becomes really interesting is when you're looking at querying a lot of data. So one of the things that we do at Decide is we build a lot of predictive algorithms. We do uh, machine learning and data mining on really, really large data sets. And so we're constantly reading a lot of this data. So in order to read it fast, if it took us 30 minutes to retrieve that data, it would really slow down our speed of innovation and development. So that's a really uh, significant business impact. And at the end of the day, there's a, a fundamental truth about databases. And I'll use some other people's quotes to tell you what it is. So looking at Mongo, and I'm just going to read an, ex an excerpt. I can never say that word. 
<laughs> of the quote uh, for you. It's, as the size of your hot data set, uh, the data that's frequently read at, substantial, at sustained rates above disk I.O., approaches available memory, write operation bursts that exceed disk write I.O. capacity can create a trashing death spiral. So that's not good, right? But people can say, oh, well, that's Mongo. But Redis is one a lot of people will use for these sorts of uh, scenarios. And if you just read this quote, it says, Redis is an in-memory persistent on disk database. So it represents a different trade-off where a very high uh, read, write and read speed is achieved with the limitation of data sets that can't be larger than memory. So at the end of the day, the truth is, Databases are only fast if you can fit your entire data set in memory. So that's a really powerful concept if you think about it, because that either means that you're going to have to have really big servers to accommodate all that data. But then if you're doing that, then I would ask the question of, is there a way to keep all that data in memory yourself? And this is what we asked ourselves: is there a way that we can do this that would make things really fast and make both our service and our site fast, as well as our ability uh, to query and innovate on top of that data? So by getting rid of our big database, we get operational relief of not having that uh, large system. Uh, we can scale these caches infinitely as our product data and services grow. And we also have huge performance gains because we're reading every single piece of data from memory. Um, the one problem is consistency, right? We still have that problem. So let me talk about what we do to fix consistency and then I'll tell you a little bit how you can do this yourself and how we made this work. So with our business, we have made the decision that giving a great user experience is more important than having data be absolutely accurate 100% of the time. And so what we do, and, and that's I think an important trade-off because not everyone will make that trade-off, but we did because we wanted, if a user just says there's eight sellers with this product, that when they click there, there's eight that show up. And so we use two techniques, and that's we deploy the entire, everything in a cell, which is basically all of the data, one kind of partition together, and until all of that data is ready, uh, we won't serve requests from it. So we have this notion of a deployment cell. The other thing we do is we have sticky user sessions to each of those deployment cells so that the users get a consistent experience the entire uh, session they're at the site. And this allows us to then update each one separately. So that's how we fix it, but it may be different for everybody. So now let's talk about getting all the data into memory. Um, so how do you fit it all in? And I always think about this quote because people always will say, oh, premature optimization is the root of all email, or evil, email, huh? same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm funny. Um, no, but anyway, uh, so, it, and it is. You don't want to solve problems you don't have. But people forget the, the second part of the, the very last part that comes right after that sentence which is you shouldn't uh, pass up the opportunities where there are chances to really optimize and get those huge performance gains. And so I come back to my question of like, how do you fit all this data in memory? And I'm gonna tell you how you can do it with your data. So here's the answers. And the answer is gonna come in five parts. And uh, so the first part is really about domain model design. So I'm a big believer that most problems in scaling typically come down to data. And so really understanding what is the customer use case? How are they querying against your data? What are the business needs? What's the business logic? Is really important to building a really scalable system. And I think this is really true, especially with your domain model design and really thinking about how you put it together. And so here are some guidelines. So the first one is about keeping it immutable. And to me, uh, I've been doing a whole bunch of Objective-C programming recently, and if anyone's been doing that, you'll know that every object initially is created as immutable, and you have to override it to say that it's mutable and you're gonna write the data. And the reason they do that is because it makes everything fast, right? So you're on mobile and, and uh, you want, uh, it's like embedded programming. And if you can do that with your data for your websites, uh, that can help a lot. So really understanding when you need to read and write data. 
and because this helps a lot with concurrency. And if you're using a garbage collected language like Ruby or Java, like they love immutable data. Um, it makes things much faster. Um, the other thing that you want to do is use independent hierarchies. I mean, in school and, and people always talk about object-oriented programming and all these instantiations and inheritance, but sometimes in real life that sort of normalization and structure actually doesn't help with performance. So really understand what your hierarchies are and think about, you know, how should they be stored together? Will they compress better? Those sorts of questions. Uh, can sometimes be better than doing what logically might be good object-oriented design. Um, the other thing is you really want to optimize your data. And I'm going to talk a lot about that, so I'm kind of going to skip over that point, but understanding your data and really knowing it gives you a lot of opportunities to save space and make it fast. So how, how many people know what interning is? Okay. Good. Now, so you all get to learn something except for the people who raise their hands. Um, this, I, well, I didn't know that much about this until like a year ago. But um, you can intern immutable variables. And what this essentially does is it says don't copy it. So when you would refer to a string, it's actually referring to that same string. So even if it's like a substring, like if, if the word is pot and is part of hippopotamus, it'll use that same reference. Like it won't make new copies of those substrings. And this can be really handy because you're not generating any extra objects, but you're also allowing uh, comparisons to happen really fast because you're essentially comparing two pointers of uh, locations rather than the whole string. And so this can really make things uh, fast. And it's available in uh, Java, Ruby, a few other languages, Lisp, Smalltalk, I think. Um, and it's really easy to implement. So this is all you have to do. So this is an example. And I'll make my slides available if people want to see the code. But this is essentially interning in action. Um, so it's pretty easy. So I mentioned independent hierarchies. And I just wanted to show a quick example, because I feel like a visual representation helps uh, speak a thousand words. Or Man, today I cannot talk. It's the end of the day, which is really not the end of the day. I, I'm in Seattle, so it's probably like lunch. Um, but I did get up early. So, and what you can see in this diagram is that you have uh, the product data, and a normal person might say, okay, then this has uh, an instantiation of an offer and all these different things. Um, but what we do instead is we create an offer feed, which has all the offers with the product IDs. And then when we want to generate the product info, uh, we kind of call all these together and aggregate them into one. And it's different, but allows us to compress similar data that is very like-minded. It allows us to express uh, dependencies on whole data sets. And it makes everything faster. So there's a lot of advantages to this sort of setup. So let's go to number two. So we just talked um, a lot about domain model uh, pieces. But thinking about the collections of your data and how you optimize them is really important. So one of the best things you can do is really leverage uh, the primitives. So in Java, there's a library called Trove, which and if you don't need Java, it's not that important. There's similar things in other languages. But what's interesting about Trove is instead of using um, uh, chaining, like the normal uh, hash, hash set in Java, they use uh, open addressing, which means that uh, with chaining, every time you have a collision, you kind of create this array for the extra items. Uh, open addressing uses different probing techniques to find another place uh, in the set. And this means that you're not creating all those extra arrays, so you save a lot of space. Or not arrays, maps, I'm sorry, at which are arrays, but <laughs> I digress. Um, and it also means that it's typically a little bit faster because trove tables are always uh, prime in size, like a prime number, so you can get, tend to get the optimal distribution of entries. So there's a lot of advantages to them. Um, so my biggest you know, lesson to you is think about your primitives and the data structures that you're actually using. So another example, um, instead of using something like a Java hash map, you can actually build your own. And this makes a lot of sense if you have small immutable data sets. Uh, so I'm essentially giving you a free pass to design your own data structures, which I think is pretty cool. I would have liked to do that when I was in school anyway. Um, and it's really easy. Like, here's an example. But what's really exciting about this isn't the free pass part. 
it's actually the order of magnitude space savings that you get by doing it, by just thinking about how your data is represented and ways of optimizing those collections of like data. So the third thing that you can do uh, to fit all this data in memory is to use uh, numeric data optimization. So everyone probably knows that numbers generally compress pretty well and they uh, tend to take up less space. And so let's talk about an example. So this is a price history graph. So if you go to decide.com in one of our product pages, uh, you'll see uh, the price history of products. We try to have uh, about two years for most products um, that we've had for a while. The interesting thing uh, about this is this is actually loaded as individual data points. We don't load this as an image or a graph, and they're all really, really fast. And the reason why is because they're loaded from memory. And let me just kind of tell you what that means. So we have more than a million products, but just for the sake of uh, math, let's assume we have a million products with uh, two offers generally and uh, two years of data. That's about two billion price points. So if you were to just implement this naively, uh, you might use a tree map because that probably makes sense for this type of data set. And at the 88 bytes it takes uh, for the 2 billion entries, you're looking at 180 gigabytes. So you're probably not going to put all that into memory uh, by itself, right? Especially if you have other stuff on the box. Uh, you need a big box. Uh, but the interesting thing about our price history is it's not like the stock market. Right? We're not changing uh, that frequently. It's really different. And since it's not like the stock market, it actually looks more like this where you have uh, kind of flat areas because the price will stay consistent for some amount of time, a few hours or a day, and then change. And so this allows us to take advantage of a technique called run length encoding. Um, and this is pretty simple and it works really well for pattern or series data. And uh, I actually talked about this in my talk last year at Surge, so it's kind of funny. Um, but it's really easy. You just uh, use kind of the length of the run or the series of data to represent it uh, within the, the, uh, your compressed format. So for what we do, um, and I think it's kind of clever, so I thought it was worth showing you because it might give you some ideas. Um, we use a positive number to represent the price. We always use shorts because we, you know, we don't have crazy price products in our catalog. And we drop the pennies on each transaction so it fits really easily. Um, for the negative numbers you're seeing here, that's how long that price was in effect for. So we use negative to represent the run length. And then if a product goes unavailable, which does happen, we use zeros. Um, so this whole array then is uh, 74 bytes for everything. And so when you compare that with our previous tree map implementation for our two uh, billion price points, um, our 1.2 gigabytes is much, much more manageable uh, than the 180 before. Uh, so it's, it's amazing like what kind of space savings you can have. Um, another interesting thing that we do that I, I think is worth calling out is we actually build uh, functions that uh, work on the encoded data itself. So instead of, for example, to like get the number of changes and the price over a time period, we don't um, go and uncompress the data, look at it, and then decide that. We actually write our functions to work on that encoded data. Uh, and that makes it really fast because we never ever have to uncompress it. And so the UI and what is displayed is just operating on that encoded data. You don't actually you know, uncompress it and show all those price points. Um, the moral, though, in this whole tirade is that you have to know your data. And I don't mean just like know about it, but like know it intimately. What are the boundary cases? How does it work? How are you using it? How do you plan to use it in the future? If you think through these sort of situations, um, there's all sorts of optimizations and synergies that you can take advantage of. So now let's talk about text. So this is number four out of our five. So the interesting thing about text is that um, it also offers a lot of optimizations. So one of the things that you may not know is that if you use kind of a standard string, um, there's actually a, a bit of overhead that uh, programming language introduced to manage those data types. And so one of the best techniques you can do to get better uh, compression is to convert everything to byte arrays. And if you're using uh, Java, for example, it stores um, all strings internally as UTF-16 to handle any sort of localized string. But for us, for example, we only have Latin characters. 
So by converting it to a byte array and uh, forcing it into like a single byte, you can get savings of over 50% um, by just kind of knowing about your character set. Um, and this can be really efficient. And the JVM has a flag for this. It's, not, it's a non-standard uh, flag called use compressed strings. And, and they'll do some of this for you at runtime or compile time, runtime. Uh, so you just you can turn it on if you want, but it also is good to kind of do it yourself because it's very easy and it's not super error prone. Um, and if you do have international character sets, a great way to divide your data is to divide it uh, by the character set and actually store them separately. Because then if you're only storing, say, Japanese character set, uh, characters, you can store those in just one byte if you store them separately from the Latin character sets. Um, so it's a great way of kind of partitioning or thinking about them as different data sets. And for the most part, you're not displaying uh, both character sets at the same time, typically. Now, I don't know your application, but it's just something to think about. Another really uh, useful uh, compression technique is around shared prefixes. So actually, this is another one uh, from my talk last year, too. I guess, I don't know why, but I didn't tell you guys. But uh, the interesting thing is that it works really well with URLs, which is something that a lot of people store on the web. Um, another great technique, if you have shared prefixes, is this is a great place to use interning. Uh, because instead of creating a www for every single link that you have, it will create it once and then reference that same thing in address. So it'll really cut down the objects that you're generating. Uh, so it can be really handy, and it also compresses really well. Um, this is a lot of code. But what you're seeing here is that if you have uh, just alphanumeric strings, but they're not case sensitive, uh, and they're not case sensitive, one of the greatest things you can do is you can actually convert those strings into longs um, as numbers. And this is all the code that it takes to make it happen. Uh, so it's a lot, but not not that much. Um, and this can give you a really big uh, uh, advantage for short strings for around compression and storing the data, um, making things fast. So if you have long strings, though, uh, which a lot of people do, there are also options. I'm sure you guys have all heard of gzip. Um, who hasn't? And then um, bzip2 is uh, slower than gzip, but it typically compresses smaller. And, and if you're using these, uh, you know, large strings that are megabytes can sometimes get you know, 15 to 25 percent if it's natural text. Smaller strings can get as high as 50 percent. Um, just make sure you're converting them to the byte arrays first before running the compression, because that's the best way to realize the benefits. So let's go on to number five. So we talked a lot about uh, optimizing text. So let's talk about JVM tuning. I'm only going to spend a quick second on this, because I don't know how many people actually do Java, and I'd like my talk to be as relevant to as many people as possible. Um, so with JVM tuning, you want to just make sure that you're using it um, it well, right? Like you're actually looking and knowing what's going on under the covers. Uh, one of the biggest things people do is they take advantage of what's really happening in their system. And so uh, using compressed pointers, this is often turned on, but generally if it's not, it'll save you 20 to 30 percent um, in time and space. Uh, use low pause garbage collection is pretty obvious. Uh, think about your heap size. So we generally over-provision our heaps by 30%, but make sure that you're actually watching and understanding. If you've never um, played with garbage collection, it's a great exercise. Uh, so on my next slide, um, just around JVM tuning, I kind of have two tips for you. So, and this is something if you've never done, you should do is like print garbage collection. Um, it's a great way to kind of just look at what's going on under the covers. And it's a, then you can really know like what generations, what sizes make sense for your application. Um, and if you're still seeing like the garbage collector pausing and having issues, then it may be time to uh, partition your data or so that you're in smaller heaps. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about scaling later, but uh, that's kind of the solution there. So that's the how of getting the data into memory. So now let's talk about loading the data. Um, I thought this was funny. OK, so how do you get all the data? Uh, how do you load it into the cache? So we talked about if you're using one of those big caches, you might have to write a custom loading script, right? Because uh, they, you will have cold starts otherwise. So you're, you're thinking about cache loading anyway. So for us, um, we leverage S3 pretty heavily. And so everything in our cache is populated from flat files. Uh, which is both very fast and allows us to scale really well. And uh, 
So I'm going to go through some kind of tips on how this works so that you guys can uh, apply it to your own situation. So we generally have our cooked data sets, so kind of our final data sets. Um, we compress them and store them in S3. Um, and we compress them because that way they're smaller going over the wire. You don't want to, you want to send as little data as possible so it's transmitted quickly. Um, when it comes to the format, my advice to you is if you think you won't, like make sure you can read it in five years <laughs> from now. So pick a format that makes sense that will still be, you know, human readable. As much fun as it is to come up with our own log formats. Um, the other thing is with, ca with caches. Um, you want to pull for updates. So the interesting thing is that how frequently you pull is directly proportional to your data inconsistency. So if you don't need your data to be consistent, like your data uh, isn't updated uh, frequently, it's not super time sensitive, uh, you don't need to pull that often. Um, maybe nightly or, or whenever. Uh, but if it is, you can pull every minute or whatever, and wh however often you pull is generally about how in, uh, inconsistent your data might be. So let's talk a little bit about uh, time-sensitive data. So I, I briefly uh, mentioned you know, low-frequently uh, low data. So when I think of that, I think of uh, tax data or zip code data, things that don't change that much. Um, although earlier I heard a tax talk, and I guess maybe it's more complicated than I thought. Um, <laughs> uh, the other thing is, but you know, things like uh, product data, we, we see new reviews, we see updates, you know, maybe daily. Um, and then like pricing data, we look at real-time prices and those are changing and we update our prices every 10 minutes. So um, that's a little bit shorter. Uh, and you could go even lower if you wanted. And so uh, a good strategy for managing your files that I like is that uh, if you're just doing uh, low sensitivity data, you can just use a date as like with the type of data. Um, if you're doing more high sensitivity, I think it helps to have both a full and an incremental directory in which you're kind of storing the, the roll-up and incremental. This makes cleaning up your data really easy um, in the future. So uh, it's good to think about this from the get-go, whereas if you just put it in date, sometimes it can be harder. So let's talk about the different cache loading strategies that we have. So with swapping, this is essentially uh, what you think it sounds like. You build a new cache on the side and then swap it. Um, and the advantages of this is that when your cache is immutable, it, there's no locking. So it's very fast and uh, you can do this quickly. Um, this works really well for infrequently updated data sets or um, data sets that don't need to be refreshed often or just like every night. So at Decide, we actually update our product data, our entire catalog every night. So it does a complete cache swap. So all the data that you see is completely regenerated each day. However, uh, you did hear me mention that we also do uh, real-time pricing. So the second strategy you can employ is a, a you know, kind of standard CRUD, a create, retrieve, or read, update, delete uh, a strategy. And what you do there is, um, you want to avoid kind of full synchronization situations. And deletions can be really tricky. So um, because you don't know what's consistent or what isn't. So we don't actually do deletions um, in our cache. Uh, and then the, the final part is that um, make sure that when you do these, you want to be doing it on small kind of self-contained data sets, um, both because this is going to help you with locking and unlocking, um, and as well as the synchronization. And it's also going to help uh, with concurrency and how you manage that data and scale it across partitions. And so you heard me mention trove maps, and some of you who are familiar with that are like, well, one of the reasons they're fast is they don't do a lot of locking. Um, you can do concurrent locking with them uh, using the reentrant uh, read-write lock. So there are ways of doing it. And this is exact code on how you would do it. So it's pretty short and pretty easy. So uh, I'm only showing code just to show you how easy it is to build your own cache. Um, so let's talk about some optimizations that you can make. Um, so in general, it really helps when you have these local caches to be snapshotting your data and keeping uh, periodic local copies of what's in the cache, uh, both for debugging and troubleshooting and reliability, um, but also just to compare uh, if you get a new feed, what actually has to be updated and, and, and not at the same time. So you can kind of do that in the background. Um, 
A great way of doing this is to keep CRC or hashes of your data, um, both because then it's fast to update, but also because then you'll know if data has changed or not based on the CRC. Uh, so it can be really fast and useful and also helps with data corruption. One of the most interesting things, though, about uh, cache loading, and actually one of the key reasons why we went this way instead of a big cache or a different method, is around dependent caches. So if you're using a lot of independent hierarchies to manage your data, um, dependencies between them become really important. And so for us, uh, really being able to identify these dependencies and then essentially uh, give events to tell them that they need to regenerate their data and update, kind of how this works, um, was really important to cache loading. And so what we do is for everything in one service instance, we'll go through and, and tell each other that they need to be updated or not. So it's the standard observer, observable pattern, if you're familiar with that uh, system design pattern. And so when each of them are done, uh, they essentially report their uh, deployment cell status. So you can kind of see each of the different services listed and then one cell status aggregator that then kind of uh, goes to our load balancer and says this uh, deployment cell is ready to take on requests. And what this actually looks like, and you can't really read it in our dashboard, but this is an example of uh, how this actually works and what it would look like in our system. So these uh, dependent caches. So now I bet you guys want to know how do you scale it. So it all sounds fine and good, but you mentioned partitioning, I kind of glossed over it. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons to partition. Well, actually there's two. <laughs> two reasons. One is that you can't fit all your data in the heap, so you don't have enough RAM. Or um, the, two, the second reason is that uh, you just want to keep a smaller heap. So you have other things going on in the box or uh, the garbage collector is pausing, uh, what, what have you. Um, and so it's really important that you choose the right partitioning grain. And I think this is Im as important um, as your domain model design is really thinking about how you partition uh, and segment your data. And you want to look for opportunities to le leverage uh, natural partitioning where it makes sense. So if you're using maps or uh, geographical data, that might be a good option. For us, we do uh, different product categories because really, if someone's searching for like a bike, they probably don't want to see TV data anyway, so it's a very natural kind of uh, segment for us. And here's my kind of partitioning decision tree for you. Uh, which basically means, you know, can you fit your data in a single VM? Well, then you should probably just do it. Otherwise, uh, you neither need to figure out a way to partition your data in fixed partitions or dynamic partitions. And um, obviously, it gets harder as you go. So let's talk about fixed partitions first, since they're the easiest. Um, these are typically done uh, when you assign each partition based on a configuration. So I mentioned products with categories. It works really well for when you only have up to a few hundred partitions and a small number of nodes, like 10. So it's very easy to configure and manage. Um, and so it looks something like this. It's pretty clear, pretty easy. You kind of have your nodes and your different partitions of the data and all the partitions uh, needed for the complete data set are in a deployment cell. Um, dynamic partitioning, on the other hand, is much more complicated. In this case, uh, you, you guys are probably familiar with this, so I'm not going to go over too many strategies in the interest of time. Um, but partitions are basically dynamically assigned to different nodes. Um, you want at least each partition to have, uh, to live on at least two of the different nodes, uh, primary and secondary. And you want a function that tells you uh, where it's at as quickly as possible. Um, so if you want to see what this looks like, it looks something like this. The one downside of this dynamic partitioning model, and you have this data um, not on every single node, is that you do have an extra network hop then to get some t data sets. And that's unfortunate. So let's talk about how to query the data um, and if this really matters. And then, uh, so when you go to querying this, so the other problem with this cache and this key value store, some of you might be thinking is, that it's, it might be hard to compute statistics or metrics or even troubleshoot uh, problems, but it's actually not. So there's really great ad hoc query languages that work, and since everything is in memory, um, scanning it's really fast. 
And so you can uh, query against millions of data sets, which makes all sorts of interesting uh, you know, business intelligence and uh, questions or even troubleshooting much easier. And so there's a few different languages that do this. Uh, I'm a super big fan of GeoSQL, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the languages work just really similar to SQL. They basically have four components, an extractor, um, a filter, a sorter, a limiter. Um, and it does everything uh, very similar. And so you can use it just like MapReduce. So you can fan out the queries across each partition and then reduce it down the results, essentially. And this can be really effective when you're doing a lot of data mining or uh, different sorts of questions. And you can even do it uh, multi-level. Uh, so this can be really uh, advantageous to depending on your data set and application. And uh, just for my one really advanced slide, is that if you have your own network topology, you can actually um, optimize these sort of queries against your data in real time across your application by really observing the different high capacity links and, and instead of uh, using the ones that were there before, actually using these faster ones instead. And so that helps minimize that impact of that network hop. So that's one way around it. Um, so I mentioned Joe SQL. It looks just like SQL. So that's pretty awesome because I know how to use that. Um, but the cool part about it is that it's really powerful. It does everything basically but joins. It does uh, groupings and variables, custom functions. Um, so just a real life example is uh, this is a relatively complicated query for us where we want to find significant price changes in the price history uh, for products for a specific seller. Uh, this was done for a press release. And it literally took you know, 15 minutes to write the query and uh, less than that to execute it. So very, very powerful. Um, we have a dashboard that shows our results, but that's not terribly interesting because you can't read it. Um, but what is interesting is some of the metrics around querying against it. So I just thought uh, people love numbers, so I'd show some benchmarks. Um, and all of this is in milliseconds, so you can see how fast querying millions and millions of products across our data set using SQL uh, really is. And so this is very, very powerful. Um, my last two slides, then I will be done because I'm out of time. Uh, just, I would, a talk wouldn't be complete if I didn't mention monitoring. If you do do this, it's really important. Uh, these sorts of caches have kind of different requirements around what you need to monitor um, in terms of feed size, different counts, the way uh, data comes in and out. So just make sure you're thinking through all of that when you do this. Um, and then that is the end. I have a link to my slides, which I should have probably shrunk it. Um, and I want to say thanks to Leon, who is not here, but who really, uh, he's our chief architect and built everything for the talk. So that's it. Any questions? I have extra slides. We can go through more stuff. <laughs> no, just kidding. No. Um, not that big. I mean, we, we have. Um, I have no idea what it is right now. I mean, not that many. I think we have like less than 10 nodes. And how many Facebooks? Millions, <laughs> lots. Um, but it's really, really fast. Like we, um, if you go to our website and like profile with it, I don't want to say this on camera, but if you go to our website and profile with the tool, you'll see like we're not necessarily the most, uh, we're not optimizing our site everywhere we can, but our data and our site is still really fast. And it all comes down to this uh, reference data set being in memory. Um, but it also, like I said, it really opens a lot of opportunities for us uh, around innovation because we do a lot of machine learning and data mining. And so being able to even uh, roll this in our own dev environment and query against this data is very, very powerful. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, so, so the example you gave in the beginning about um, compressing your uh, pricing sets um, was pretty interesting, looked like an interval tree, and you got crazy. Your run length encoding looked a lot like an interval tree. Do you, do you, do you, Are you talking about the run length encoding for the price history? Right. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, the data structure looked a lot like an interval tree, and it looked like the way, the way it compressed was impressive, given your data set. Um, do you Are you have talking other? about this one? Or the one before it? It was the 188 gigs to two 
Oh, yes, point, yes, yes. Whatever. Um, that's the next. Yeah, that's showing yeah. this. That one. Yeah, that slide. Um, do you have other types of data where you've achieved um, perhaps other gains that are in the 10 to 100 factor reduction as well? Or, or did you find this one and find yourself incredibly lucky that you had a problem that optimized this way? Um, well, no, I think we do have others. I mean, some of the stuff around text actually is great examples of that. Um, and a lot of the little, I call them small mutable collections, but I didn't really explain them around like what sellers are and things like that, um, are huge savings, just the way we store the data um, and using interning. But I didn't, I didn't actually benchmark them where I could uh, quote them or say them, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of, all of these kind of combined gives us a lot of opportunity. I just, uh, it just depends. The run length encoding I thought was pretty impressive. I should have probably done a similar thing on other of the compression ones, but I know um, a lot of the interning and tech stuff is really big, especially in uh, actual runtime performance, even more than compression. Yeah, I think that um, a lot of times when people look at presentations like this and they see one awesome example, they think, well, you got lucky because your data set worked for you. Um, when most, most of us, I'm sure you have this as well, there's probably about 10 or 15 different places where you chose to do that because it hurt. I mean, it, this hurt, so you had to fix the problem, so you dove in and, and fixed it. Um, well, I mean, here's the example. Uh, when we did the text to not do Unicode characters and put them in byte arrays or whatever, that was 50% of just not accepting what Java did by default, right? Um, so, I mean, it's not necessarily this big, but I think those sort of things can really add up uh, depending on how you're storing. But I think the interning strings and stuff like that can be really, really huge in just the way you copy it. But a lot of it is more realized in performance and runtime, I think, so. Like I said, no matter how hard you try, you can't take the sock op code out of JVM, but. Yeah, no well, idea. you know. But the memory, yes. Yes. Before you went down the uh, run length encoding path, uh, did you try a lazy loaded cache? Uh, I may be making a, a bad assumption here, but you're probably not going to hit the two billion points every time, every day, for all your products. Uh, did you try that, and what were the performance differences? Um, we, I mean, we, I don't, we did test a bunch of different things, but uh, this worked really well for us because even the bigger caches that, unless we had everything in memory, um, it just wasn't fast. Like we, as, as soon as you introduce that network hop, you lose the speed, right? It's driving to Florida for the hot dog, um, so. You can use those technologies, but it's not the same as having the data right there uh, that fast, all that data. So. Sure, yeah, no, I mean, I, this would obviously be faster. I was just curious, uh, given the fact that you probably have a high hit rate on, your, uh, on the actual data points. But. Yeah, I mean, well, this is the first time I've ever worked in a company that did it this way, and that's why I wanted to talk about it, because I do think it's really innovative and different. I've always done more of like the traditional architectures that you've seen um, in the past, in my past lives. So, uh, definitely, it's a different it's a different way of thinking, and I will say there there's pros and cons. I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about is that uh, you know um, the probably the biggest we don't have that much operational headache, but sometimes the feeds are not exactly the right size that we alert because we're expecting these big feeds, and sometimes like a seller will just uh, not have a big feed, and it generates unnecessary pages, and that sucks because it happens in the middle of the night when we're swabbing the cache. <laughs> so there are downsides. Any other questions? Awesome. Oh. What's the size of the cache, your server cache? Oh, gosh. Um, we're running on um, uh, large EC2 instances. So I, I think right now we just provisioned it to be 9 gigs yesterday, but it might be 12, potentially. Yes. So. Not super big. Have you ever lost data? Uh, no, because we do everything with flat files. So everything comes in as flat files from S3 and then it's pushed to the caches. So if we lose a node, it's not a big deal. And then uh, building the caches and swapping them out is a really, really fast. It's uh, probably the same speed as it caught, like to most people to warm a regular cache it is to fully load ours. So um, very fast. Large terabytes.
we did some metric. It was like for the newspaper or something. It was like between two and four terabytes of data. But it seemed like a lot to me because <laughs> it's just product data and pricing data. Question? Yes? Um, what about? Uh, so, how does that work? Do you, do you okay. like, uh, organize your data in vertical stacks from? Um, well, essentially, um, it's probably easiest, I'm, I'm looking for this slide really fast to show, because um, I actually talked a little bit about it um, when I was showing the, uh, this uh, dependent caches, a little bit how it looks, I think. Um, what you see here is essentially um, each of those services is serving a different type of data. And so um, it, what they're doing then is in that deployment cell, uh, each of them are sort of loaded separately and the cell isn't active until all of them are ready, which means all of them are populated and if something has been uh, updated, like a type of data, that all the dependent caches are updated as well. And that's kind of how this works, so that uh, when one comes up online, it kind of waits for the other. So that's a really key thing that we, we do. Um, and then each one has its own load balancer uh, for that deployment cell, which allows us to control stickiness at the load balancer level. Or is behind the, all, each of them is like one instance behind the load balancer. Sorry, long day. So one of the first things you mentioned in the very beginning of your presentation was that delineation between reference data and user data. Do you use the same architecture and same strategies for handling your more dynamic user data? No, uh, we don't. Um, we use, um, we don't. We use a, a more of a traditional uh, sort of setup for that, yeah. Because uh, with those, you're in a heavy read, heavy write situation, so a lot of the optimizations and the immutability doesn't apply. And so I wouldn't recommend this model for that type of data. Any other questions? Thank you guys for all the great questions. I'm happy to talk to anyone else if they have more questions. And uh, thanks for coming to my talk. <laughs>